So today we're talking about chapter six of the book. Um, it's a it's a very natural thing when we're doing a book club to kind of go through, you know, by chapter, and then unless a chapter is particularly long, then maybe we break it into two. Um, I gotta say that uh, chapter six, you know, I counted the pages, but once I went through the content, it's like, wow, this chapter is even shorter than the page count would seem to indicate. So. We'll see if there's discussion about this, but um, this might be a very short meetup. I don't know, we'll see. All right, so um, section one of the chapter, uh, so chapter title, what do you mean probably? So talking about probability, but really not all of probability, just a very narrow slice of how you deal with probability for this sort of error correction concept. Um, so section one, uh, before we get into any theory, just gives example of probabilities of getting different kinds of cookies from a cookie machine. So you have four, you know, different kinds of cookies. And, you know, one of, the, one of the, the trains of thought that the author introduces is if you went and you got a bunch of cookies, um, you know, you might start to have some suspicions as to, as to what the probabilities of getting a particular cookie are just from the number you got. You know, if one of them was supposed to, if they're all supposed to be equal, but you got half one, half another, then you might start to get suspicious. Is it really, you know, the two I never got any of? Is it really 25% chance of getting those? So then in section two, more formally um, defines, I don't think we'll need these definitions too much, but but if you if you are interested in sort of probability. So the definition of the sample space, it's all your possible outcomes. A random variable, uh, what a probability distribution is, and um, the note at the end that basically when we're doing quantum computing, we're usually going to have discrete sample spaces whose outcomes are the basis vectors in a complex vector space of dimension two to the n. Right. So really, no discussion about continuous probability distributions in this chapter. This is this is really just the the basics you need. Um, for it doesn't matter how large it is, things still operate the same if it's discrete. So two to the n, n could be a thousand, but still a discrete space. So, so the math works the same. Any comments, questions, additions? All right. So now we start talking about instead of general probability, right? Uh, we're talking about errors. So earlier in the book, um, he introduced the, this idea of like, how could you um, try to overcome, um, you know, a, a communication channel that had errors in it. And so a simple method of doing it is just you repeat things. So if I said to you, I'm going to send you one letter at a time, but each letter I'm going to send five times, and then the next letter I'm going to send five times, the next letter I'm going to send five times. If you saw, you know, four out of five were T's and three out of five were H's and five out of five were E's, you'd probably say, okay, the word's the, because even though there were a couple of them that didn't match, you know, the majority of them were all T, H, and E, right? So this is, this is the math behind that type of error correction. Um, and ultimately what he gets to is that if you have a fixed error rate, you know what that error rate approximately is, it's P, um, and you repeat the calculation n times, the assumption here is that when we're repeating something, they're all independent. So the odds of the second one getting garbled are completely independent of whether or not the first one got garbled. Um, then if you know your probability, you know, you're just multiplying independent probabilities for independent events. And so uh, basically there's a formula that you can use where you just take, you know, P or one minus P, you know, to a certain power, which is the number of repetitions. And so for any arbitrary value you choose, if I want it to be within 1%, if I want it to be within 10th of a percent, if I want it to be within a millionth of a percent, um, you can basically calculate how many times you'd have to repeat it in order uh, for the likelihood of all of them being screwed up to be below that value epsilon. So I think hopefully, any questions, hopefully people who even who haven't formally taken probability, that's, um, that's a pretty, uh, accessible concept. All right. 
And um, so then it just gets very formally into it. I probably said too much. I probably leaked into the next section. So section 6.4 is now um, the probability of getting the message right. Um, we few enough errors that it can be corrected. And so, um, so one of the things that you, I guess that's slightly different in this chapter, in this section is just dealing with the fact that if you send something three times, if it gets garbled twice, then you're probably gonna lose, right? If you send something seven times, if it gets garbled four times, you know, you, you might lose. So uh, I don't know if lose is the right technical term, but anyway, so instead of just, you know, what's the probability of getting them all right or one wrong or whatever, like now it's just sort of summing up that less than half of them get garbled. Um, and so then there's the formula for that. And so then the questions are, you know, you can calculate like, what if you want to get it right? 99.99% of the time. All right, any thoughts, comments, anything else anybody's done that's related to this? I think that that section was one of the most interesting to me because I just haven't thought of error correction in, in that way, really. I think one of the interesting parts is, is the way that you've been describing it is it is sort of like the message cleanly gets through or it doesn't, but there's kind of a second layer on top of that of like um, a, a portion of it is going to be overlapping and the same. So if you send something a million times, even if one bit is off every time, eventually you're going to get the whole thing just by overlap and, and consensus because it's not going to be the same bit wrong every time. Um, yep. I just think yeah. that's, in, that, that's kind of something they do in, in all kinds of different radio technology where it's like we, we know that the, the completely accurate message isn't getting through, but we, we've got good enough and we can send something multiple times. Yeah. Um, uh, probably dating myself a little bit here, but like, um, so, so those of you who are younger may not understand this example, but, um, you know, for music, we have these CDs and, and so they, they've sort of stamped information on, onto this, this CD and when CD players first came out, it was actually pretty hard for people to build the hardware that all worked fast enough to read um, the data stream. It's, it's uh, 44 kilohertz of 16 bit stereo signals. You can do the math of how many whatever bits per second that is. But it was pretty hard for people to build the hardware to be able to keep up with that. And CD players were, were pretty expensive. And they were admittedly sometimes kind of glitchy. But so then as the, the, the hardware got better, I don't remember the exact way they named it, but they had something like two times sampling CD players or whatever. Uh, but basically that meant that, that they, could, they could spin the disc twice as fast and read everything twice and, and try and, you know, um, because stuff had a, a sort of a code to it you wouldn't necessarily know what the right value was, but you would know, like, like imagine there's a parity bit or something. You would know that it was garbled, but you wouldn't know what the right value is, but if you read it twice. And so then I think, you know, pretty soon people latched onto, oh, well, that actually is a very good thing. And so then um, soon after that, people had whatever, four times, I don't know if they call it oversampling or whatever. And I don't know if they spun the disk faster or if they just kind of were able to read multiple times or whatever. But anyways, the hardware got better. And so then basically original CD players were very kind of glitchy. So just like a record player could skip, a CD player could, could have skips and stuff. And uh, um, they, they uh, um, pretty soon that was like not something anybody ever thought about was whether or not your, your, your CD player was gonna have a glitch or a skip or something like that, just cause the hardware got fast enough. Um, but I think they were using this simple, the same concept, Brian, of just repeating and, you know, if you do whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading an article way back in the 80s about um, the old space shuttle. You know, it had multiple computers and they just had a, 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 a built in concept where, like, if it's doing a calculation on, like, how long to burn the engines or something like that, that basically they would all vote 
And if, you know, three of them agreed and one of them didn't, didn't agree, then the majority wins. That's what the, um, so all the calculations somehow would go through this final voting process. They would just be repeated in parallel and go through the voting process. All right, anything else? Just my own example about it. Uh, you know, with COVID, everybody who had symptoms got a risk of getting long COVID. Well, I looked it up. What the probabilities, what the research here, and computed that in uh, during eight years, about each uh, seventh person will get long COVID. And well, this is an example of accumulation. I hope it won't come to this. I hope we'll do something <laughs> to avoid it. Yeah, if it's a seventh, I mean, you know, 14% of the population, that's like, mm -hmm. I, I, my company does stuff, right? I think that's like more, gonna be more than like heart failure, more than kidney disease, more than like a lot, yes. a lot of things. Yes, it reminds me the story with polio when the US health system was just overwhelmed with uh, pa paralysis, I think, or some other kind of effects from the sickness. Yep. All right, cool. Thanks, Maya. Mm -hmm. All right, if people are interested in this, we'll finish up the chapter and then we, we can talk about that some more too. All right, so section 6.5 is just uh, some Python code for generating pseudo-random numbers. So just explaining for people who are non-programmers, hey, if you wanted to generate um, something with a sample space of size 4, and the first outcome has 19% probability, the second outcome has 30% probability, so forth, how would you actually run the code to, uh, you know, for each, I don't know what you want to call it, for each roll the dice, you know, to, to pick one of those four events. Um, and then section 6.6 six defines um, expectation or expected value, mean, variance, standard deviation. Um, those I'm fairly familiar with. The next section is where there was stuff that I was not so familiar with. So before we go on to 6.7, any, any questions about expectation, mean, variance? All right. So, um, so then we get to see Markov's inequality, Chebyshev's inequality, which leads us to the weak law of large numbers. And I'm not sure, uh, maybe the more astute of you math wise um, can sort of point to this, but basically these, these three, Markov's inequality, Chebyshev's inequality, weak law of large numbers, they apply to any distribution even if you don't know what that distribution is. Um, and it just so happens that in our case, we're talking about known distributions. And so um, I think that in fact, we can use these as equalities instead of inequalities. Um, but but the, the, those, those formulas hold, even if you have no idea what the distribution is and you don't even know how skewed or how much there's outliers it's still always always true so um i hadn't seen those before i think those are are very cool inequalities and i don't know how i don't know how these guys came up with with these formulas but um, they're pretty cool so in the end the result is that uh even if you um well again basically we're just gonna do repetitions and we can set a certain epsilon that we wanna be you know, certain about. So I wanna be certain within 0.1%. Um, and then basically for, for a given probability, you can say, hey, if you do this many repetitions then you're guaranteed it's at least within 0.1%. It might actually, depending on the distribution, be much tighter than that, you know, if the, if the distribution's you know, really narrow. Even if you don't know, you're guaranteed. So that's um, that's like the really uh, key formula that I think that we're going to see. Um, the only other comment that I had about this chapter is 
we haven't talked about it, but I think most people have enough exposure to either quantum mechanics or, or, or have done light reading on quantum computing that if you recall, we're gonna have this qubit and the qubit might be in a certain state where let's say it's two thirds probability um, of getting a one and a one third probability of getting a zero. In order to actually um, um, observe that qubit, we're either gonna get a one or a zero. Okay, we're never going to get a floating point number out of it. We're not going to get a two thirds. We're not going to get a whatever. So the only way that you can know that it's two thirds is basically you repeat the experiment multiple times where you keep generating this qubit that has a two thirds value. And then if you do it 100 times and you say, okay, I got 68 ones and, you know, 32 zeros, I think it's around 68%. You repeat it 1,000 times, you repeat it 10,000 times, and then eventually you're like, well, it was like 66.66, you know, percent of my trials were ones and, you know, 33.33 were zeros. So I think it's, you know, two thirds. Um, so I think that's gonna, that's gonna play into, into basically um, the way we're gonna build our quantum algorithms and the way we're gonna use these formulas. Um, but I think the other thing that's gonna get thrown into this is that, the quantum computers we're building today are not perfect, they're not error free. So in addition to the fact that you're trying to read this qubit that has a 60, you know, 7% chance of being a one is the fact that a certain percentage of the time the experiment goes wrong and there's noise introduced by the outside environment. And so then it's not actually at 67%. So now you have to add on a whole nother layer of, of how many times do you have to repeat this in order to get values out of it? All right, so then in summary, basically, um, um, we're gonna have this probability that helps us calculate repetitions. And we're gonna be working with these discrete sample spaces whose sizes are powers of two. And somehow, when we do these calculations, we're gonna devise an algorithm. We're gonna have the set of calculations that we perform, the manipulations of these qubits. We're gonna do them so that we want the, the answer to the problem that we're trying to pose to be the highest probability. Um, so if we, if we assign each answer to like one of the bases of the, 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 the vector space, um, we want the basis that that has the highest probability um, to actually correspond with the, the best solution to our problem, something like that. I don't know. I have not read ahead, so I'm, I'm not, I don't know exactly how all this stuff's going to work. All right, so pretty short and sweet. That's, that's kind of all I got for, um, for this chapter. I'm really looking forward. So the math stuff, the preliminaries are good, but next week we actually are really talking about qubits and we're actually talking about quantum computers finally. So um, we'll have the preliminaries all out of the way. Any comments, questions, anything to add? I have some comments. They cited theorems pretty well. Markov inequality does not require any restrictions on distribution. It just requires that our values of a random variable should be always positive. That's it. Um, there is something though which is not stated directly, but basically it is assumed. Um, if they write expectation in the formula, the assumption that it is finite. If they write a variance in the formula in the theorem, and it is, a, you, you know, quite often it is stated explicitly, but sometimes they skip it. If you have, if you see variance in the formula, it means that variance should exist too and should be finite. But the thing, well, for me, it is interesting how it works for any distribution. There is no restrictions. 
And by the way, law of large numbers works for any distribution too, but it does have explicit mentioning that expectation should ex exist and uh, variance should be exist, be finite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Maya. So in our case, where I think for now, we're only gonna deal with uh, finite sample spaces. Then in a finite sample space, the expected value and the variance will always be finite and defined, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so because they mentioned, they were talking about discrete random spaces and discrete random spaces are not necessarily finite okay. that's right that's right i think you can you can have an infinite variance in a countably infinite discrete sample space so so that's why what you're saying is important for the general case but i'm saying for the quantum computer case mm -hmm. i think we won't reach countably infinite we'll simply be dealing with finite uh, Yes, it's correct. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Maya. You're welcome. Anything else? All right. So um, I'm just going to say thanks for uh, for for joining us and sticking with the, the math part of it. If any of this helped level set for you guys, there's there's a few things, especially a few things in the linear algebra that that um, definitely helped me to go through this. Uh, but personally, I'm a little bit I'm a little bit impatient. So uh, so for me, at least, thanks for sticking through all the math stuff and maybe the real quantum computing stuff, you could say, uh, begins next week. So very much looking forward to to that part. I have a right. feeling that not all mathematics will be needed, you know, explicitly, because if you remember, we talked about monoids, I make a search in the book and monoids are mentioned only in this first chapter, foundation, oh, yeah. sorry, yep. not, first part. The chapter. author did say in a few places, like I added 10% more just because I think it's so cool. Um, but, but even the stuff that is used may not be mentioned by name. So, you know, I don't know if the, the author is explicitly going to talk about some of the linear algebra stuff, uh, but it, it, it still may be the underpinning of, of what's going on, even if he doesn't mention it all by name. Well, my students will hate it. Most of them. <laughs> yeah. All right. I would so sometimes. Ryan, maybe we yeah. Maybe we end the recording here, and then if people want to chit chat a little bit more, we can we can stay and then uh, take a break before the the. Sure. Sure.